I was listening to the sermon by somebody this week. I only heard half the sermon because when it was, for some reason, it was on YouTube and then it said, turn the tape over. And I said, well, I can't turn the tape over. I'm on YouTube and I couldn't get it back. When I finally got back to it, he started all over from the beginning. So I don't know how he ended the sermon. But it was based on Romans 15. I just want to read this text because I think it's important. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. In other words, Paul is saying what's very important about a Christian life is we don't just think about ourselves. We worry about those who have problems who are weak, who have emotional issues, who have mental issues, who have physical issues, people that are weak, weak in the faith. And we need to be strong. We need to be thinking about that, not just ourselves. We can't be just putting ourselves first all the time. But the measure of our faith as a Christian is to be concerned about other people, to be helping other people, to uphold other people, to edify other people. In fact, that exact word is used in the rest of the verse. Therefore, think of your neighbor for his or her good leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself but came to please God and others. Amen. So listen, Jesus is the door. This uh, text in uh, the Gospel of John says Jesus is the door. You know, I was watching a movie called Interstellar. Have you seen that, Interstellar? Kind of weird. Interstellar, and then I saw another movie called Stargate. You all saw that. That's an oldie, right? That's because all the Egyptians came from now. Uh, they were aliens, right, Larry? All the Egyptians, they were aliens. So anyways, uh, interstellar, it's all about how they go out into space because they're trying to find a solution to the problems of Earth, and they go to a wormhole, which is also called a black hole, and that it becomes, it's explained, it's a theory, is a portal that takes a shortcut all the way across the galaxies and solar systems into space and lands you where you want to go, and if you would have not gone through the wormhole or black hole, they kind of use those words interchangeably, it would take you many, many, many years longer, but this is like a shortcut. You go through the portal, and you know what Stargate is. And they got, went through Stargate, and then they ended up home in another civilization all the way across the outer space. And so it's a door. It's a door of opportunity to travel through space. Jesus Christ, listen, is the spiritual Stargate. Jesus Christ is the spiritual, I'm not going to call him the black hole, I'm not going to call him the hole. He's the hole of opportunity. He's a hole in one. He's the spiritual shortcut. He's the spiritual essence that can take us, if we go through the door, we go through to a new dimension of living. And we have to remind ourselves of that daily. You're not just living a normal life once you're a believer, once you've accepted Jesus. You're living a supernatural, affected, powerful life because of the Holy Spirit and because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, I am the door to that opportunity. The person who passes through that door, he says three things, will be saved, will go in and out, will find pasture. What does that mean? You will be saved, you have salvation. Salvation from what? Salvation from the consequences of sin. What are the consequences of sin? Death, says the Bible. But you are saved from that. You have life, life to celebrate. And life eternal. In and out means you come in and out of the sheepfold because you are free. Jesus said, I came to set the captives free. You will find pasture. It means you're going to be at peace. You're going to be satisfied. I always remember a preacher preaching on the 23rd Psalm, and he said, I lay me down in green pastures. And he said, what does that mean? Well, sheep, just to look at sheep. In fact, 15 sheep went through my backyard last, last week. I don't know what that was all about. But anyway, sheep, they keep walking around and walking around because they want to eat. They're always eating. And that's why they're always walking. When a sheep sits down, they're satisfied. And they're at peace. That's why the Lord makes you lie down in green pasture, because you're at peace. Your soul is at peace. So it says, I am the open door. Revelation says, before you is an open door. Revelation also says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation says, Revelation 3, 8, before you is an open door that no one can shut. There is an open door of God before you. All you have to do is step through it. Now, remember that play called No Exit? Have you ever read that play by Jean Paul Sartre? Jean Paul Sartre? I bet you were thinking about that when I was talking about the door. 
because you first started to wrote this play, it was the, the, the uh, theater of the absurd, existential philosophers, atheists who said there was no hope. And that's, that play is about people in hell. And they're in a room. And they don't know it, I don't think. And I, I haven't read it so long. But I don't think they realize where they are. But they're in hell. And there's a door. And the door is closed. And they're in hell. And the door, at one point of the play, opens. And not one of them is able to get up and leave. They sit there. They're captives. They don't have the motivation. They don't have the spiritual strength to get up and leave hell, even though the door opens. And then the door closes. Well, listen, let's rewrite that play. Let's rewrite that play as Christians. Jesus comes. Jesus opens the door. Everybody sits there. But Jesus goes down for every one of them and saves them and gives them salvation and gives them strength. And whatever their sin is, whatever reason they're in hell, whatever's going on in their life or death, he goes and changes them and gives them newness of life. And he says, come with me. Come through that door. We forgive you. You are forgiven. I'm giving you a new life. Come with me through that exit. You are going out of that exit. I'm changing that play forever. I'm going to rewrite it. Gene Paul Joe Bodnar. That was a joke. Gene Paul Joe Bodnar. Saved. Saved by the blood of the Lamb. Adam and Eve walked through the door. God, when they sinned, God took them and made them exit paradise. And they had to leave. And there's a painting. If you go to the Sistine Chapel, I think that's where it is, right? Michelangelo, the old thing, the Sistine Chapel. He sat up there on the scaffold and painted all these paintings. Well, I was sitting in a doctor's office recently. They had Italy. It was a book about Italy. And there was the whole Sistine Chapel painting. I was looking at it. I don't know what half of it is. I don't know what it is. I need a book to tell me what it is. But I recognize one scene or two scenes. One is where God is reaching out to Adam and giving him life. Remember that? The other one is when Adam and Eve are leaving paradise. And they're being cast out. And Satan gave them the wrong thing to eat the knowledge of good and evil, they started making decisions for themselves, and they're leaving paradise. They are exited. They took the door. They had to leave, and the door was shut. They were out of paradise. But then remember what happened on the cross. Jesus was on the cross. Of all the things he could have said, he said, he looked down on those people that were torturing him and killing him and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know how many times a week we can say that? People are doing things, people are hurting us, people are messing around, hurting people, doing crazy things. Father, forgive them. They, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing. That's the problem. Father, forgive them, he said to the man. And the man heard that. The man turned to him and said, remember me when you come in your kingly power. And what did Jesus say to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise. So when the door was slammed shut on Adam and Eve, Jesus reopened it. And he gave this man access into, I went to the word study on that, by the way. I had to do it for seminary. And that's the same meaning of the same word paradise is the same word used for paradise where Adam and Eve uh, were thrown out of. And so Jesus is the door back to paradise. Jesus is the door back to peace with God. When Lazarus came out of the grave, he's in the dark, dead grave. He's bound up with bandages like a mummy. By the way, there's a new bunny movie with Tom Cruise of all people. It's on this week. Have you seen it? Crazy, right? Tom Cruise is the mummy. And the mummy, and, and the mummy is in the grave, the tomb, and, the, and there's a stone rolled over it. It's Lazarus. He's been dead four days. And Jesus says, open, push away the stone. In other words, open the door. See, Jesus is the door. He's dead. He's in darkness. Everything, he, he's messed up. And his sister says, don't open the grave. It's a mess. He's been dead four days. And Jesus says, don't take the stone away. He says, didn't I tell you you would see the power of God? Didn't I tell you you were going to see the resurrection of the dead? And he says, Lazarus, come out of there. Come out. Well, don't you know that dead person heard his voice? Wouldn't it be something if Jesus went to Memorial Park where we buried half of our members and stood up there by the open Bible, made a stone and said, everybody, get up. If he did it, they would. Lazarus came out because Jesus is the door of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, I am the resurrection and the life. John 12, and out came Lazarus, and Jesus simply said, unbind him, unbind him, unroll the wrappings, and let him go. See, everybody's looking for eternal life. 
The pharaohs built the pyramids. They put their chariots in there. They killed their family members. They put all their belongings in there because they think they're going to use them in the afterlife. They put their organs into these things and make them mummify them. I don't know what they do. They even mummify their cats. Can you imagine that? Mummifying my cats. <laughs> because they want to live forever. Dracula sells his soul, drinks his blood. Why? Because he wants to live forever. The werewolf gets bitten, gets bitten the guy being long chatty becomes the werewolf. If you can't kill him, he's going to live forever. Unless you shoot him with a silver bullet. That's why I call my suburban the silver bullet. That's, that's what people want. They want to live forever. There's only one person who's the portal that will take you to everlasting life. There's only one person who will take you through the wormhole of the universe stratosphere and you'll end up in the kingdom of God in paradise where Adam and Eve were told to leave and only Jesus could say to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise because only Jesus is the door and he opens that door where there's no exit and brings people into everlasting life and if you want fullness of life now, today, tomorrow, and forever and ever, there's only one way to get it, and that's to go through the door, Jesus Christ, who gives it to us now and always, the inspiration. And after that, you've got no problem with motivation. People go, I can't get motivated, I can't get motivated. Well, of course you can't get motivated. If you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not following a divine plan, if you're not listening to the purpose of Jesus Christ, you're not going to be motivated. <clears throat> and how did Jesus motivate people? See, how do people get motivated? There's about five ways people get motivated. You threaten them. You know, the day we thought the church was on fire, remember the, the smoke was out there? People got motivated then. I said, church on fire. Woo, everybody get up. Before that, they were kind of you know, getting sleepy. So they get motivated, get scared. You get somebody in a chair and you say, you're motivated. Get up, run, run around the box ten times. I'm not motivated. Oh, yeah, we'll put the chair at the bottom of the swimming pool. Look at the about three minutes, when he can't breathe, they'll get motivated, believe me. Somebody says, I don't want to eat, I don't feel like you know, eat for a week, and they'll be motivated. Don't feed my cats for a day, they'll get motivated. They'll be bonkers over the wall, man. Because they're motivated with a need, they're motivated with fear. They motiv people get motivated with fears, with needs. Jesus did not motivate people that way. He didn't say to Peter, listen, you go out there and preach the gospel, or else I'm going to give it to you. See? He didn't motivate his disciples that way. He didn't say, do it or I'm gonna, you're going to get it. I can take the house. You say, I calm the sea. Oh, I'm going to make a tornado and come right and blow your house away. No. This is how he motivated. He showed people the best of humanity. He showed us what we can become. He showed us our potential. He showed us how great we can be as people. How wonderful it could be. Then he showed us how wonderful it could be in our family. Then he showed us how wonderful it could be in our community. Then he showed us how wonderful it could be in the whole world. And then he said, the day is going to come when all this will happen and all people will live in harmony and uh, swords will be turned into plowshare. Lions will get along with lambs. Cats will get along with mice. People will love each other. White people and black people. People of all cultures. People from all around the world. They're going to be hugging each other and loving each other because that's the vision Jesus Christ gave us. He motivated us to do our best. We need the touch of the master, the touch of the master. And uh, it's like that story where the, that sculptor, as you know, probably know, but it still fits in here. And uh, he wanted to be a great sculptor. And so he started sculpting in his studio. His father was a fantastic sculptor, by the way. And he was doing this statue. And every night when he retired, he, there was all these mistakes. And he'd go to bed. He got up in the morning, he'd go down to the studio to work. He looked at all of them, he said, I can't believe it, all the mistakes. I thought I had all these mistakes. And everything in the sculpture was fixed. It was perfect. This went on day after day, week after week. He said, every night I go to bed at night, the sculpture is a mess. I wake up in the morning, it's perfect. Huh. Am I dreaming? Am I hallucinating? One day he got up early. Earlier than usual, went down to the studio, looked in, and there was his father, the master sculptor, fixing every mistake, making the work of art perfect. And he said, ah, the master has touched it. The master has touched it.
That's your life. We make a mess of it. We mess up. We feel guilty. We screw up. Excuse the language. We do all kinds of crazy things. We feel compounded with guilt. It's so heavy we can't. It's like carrying an anvil around. And God comes and takes the pieces. He puts it all together, fixes it all up. And because of God, you see, we are made into the image of Jesus Christ. And we are sons and daughters of the living God. There's a nice, great closing story. You've heard it before. You won't remember it, though. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. The master's touch called the auctioneer. I, 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 in honor of myself, I should tell this story. <laughs> yeah, this is how it goes. T'was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer, he thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two? Two dollars, who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice. Going for three, but no. From the back of the room, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars. Who'll make it two? Two thousand dollars. Who'll make it three? Three thousand dollars. Three thousand dollars twice. Going, going, and gone, said he. Well, the people cheered. Some of them cried. We don't quite understand. What changed its worth? Swift came to reply. The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune and battered and scarred with sin is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, and he's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Let us pray. God, Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. And in the words of Paul, may we, may we be mindful of others. May the strong be ready to uphold the weak. May those that have much be ready to share. May we not only think of our own needs and desires, but that of others. To help those that are ill, those that are hurting, those that are suffering, those who don't know where they're going in life, may we be the one that helps them. May our church be a beacon of light to those in darkness. May our church be a bulwark of hope. May the victory of Jesus Christ shine through the stained glass windows to those walking the streets. And may our words and our actions speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. And may the Lord find a dwelling here. And may the Holy Spirit Shake the very foundations of the building and of the people and of ourselves. And may we find an oasis here of peace and hope and victory to the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.